Okay. Okay, that's a long, awkward silence. Good morning. I'm going to make one correction to the um, sausage fest notice. W women are invited. So if you, yes, uh, there's only 15 spots, and I think there's like seven spots available. So you have to bring a really sharp knife, a chopping board, and an apron. That's right, Tim. And it is going to be craft beer tasting as well. So it'll be fun. I'm surprised iBag haven't completely taken up all the spaces, actually. Um, but yes, that's, that is on the 17th in the afternoon, and it's, it's fun. We, we like to have fun. If this is your first time, welcome. And um, we're in the middle of, at the moment, of a theme called, what have you called it? Ah, the sky is red. Sorry, it still says it's take three. Um, we're, we're in a theme called the sky is red. And our, our focus has been on the environment and on sustainability. And in fact, this whole year, we've been looking at different themes like grief, like race, like identity, like um, the environment, because a problem that happens in spaces of faith or churches is that we can departmentalize. We can say, well, this is my Christian space. You know, it's all about Jesus and all of this. But actually, all about Jesus seems to change as soon as you go into the other spaces of your life. And what is my goal as a pastor is to unify these things, is to help you see that your identity as somebody who's environmentally aware, as somebody who's sustainable, as somebody who has a, a racial and ethnic, a cultural identity, that those things are embedded with and a part of your identity in God. And that your identity as a person of faith is deeply embodied in all of these aspects. And so we, um, we really want to make sure that we are helping you to see that. And so today, even though we'll be talking about the environment, we're also doing it within the context of our life of faith. So I hope you have fun. We're going to start today in Matthew 16. We've been working our way through the book of Matthew for the last year and a half. And... Um, it's, we'll pick it up. Now, we're going to do some quite interesting things today. There's going to be quite a bit of Bible reading. So if you haven't read the Bible for a while, we are going to catch up today. But there's something really special that I want you to see. And as we go on this journey, I, I, I hope it works. I hope you see um, something that you never encountered before. And so, Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will no, not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. But there's a lot going on here that I need to unpack. And before I do that, I'm from New Zealand in case you couldn't tell by my wonderful accent. <laughs> um, and I'm from a place called Nelson, which is really beautiful. And the thing about Nelson, we have this beach that when, the, when it's low tide, you can walk out about half a kilometre on a sandbank that sits just millimetres under the surface of the water. And so if you get it right in the morning, you walk out and, you know, we're, we're in a bay. So instead of seeing the sunrise over the ocean, you see the sunrise over the mountains. There's mountains behind you as well. And everything turns kind of hues of yellow and orange and red. And it catches the water and you feel like you're just standing in the middle of the ocean. And it's absolutely beautiful. And I remember moments like that where you just, you, you get a sense of God. You know, you're not in a church, you're not singing a song, but there's, there's this deep connection to God. And I've had that a few times. I mean, I remember in 2019, just before the pandemic, I was in China, 
And I stayed in a hotel right next to the Great Wall and kind of walked up this trail and I was sitting in the middle of the Great Wall of China. I was the only person there and I couldn't see another human and just lay there and again, even though it was man-made, there was so much nature and things and history and just, there was something about it. There was something about the deep connection to the rock and yeah, the wall was there, but it was autumn and the trees and it was, there's just, there's, there's a sense of something way bigger than yourself. I've got a good friend who um, has been a part of this church community for about seven years and he calls himself an atheist, which is hilarious. Um, and he once, uh, the reason it's hilarious is he was once hiking up in the Swiss Alps and he sent me a photo of him with all the mountains behind him and he just said, I'm having a God moment right now, atheist. And I said, oh, describe to me what this God moment is. And he said, it's absolute peace and calm. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. You know, tell me more. How do, I, how do I get one of these moments? Because, you know, baiting the atheist. And, and he said, they're more available to you than you realize. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> like, I love it when people don't realize how close they are to God. Yeah. And it's like, if you know, you don't want to name it what I name it, sure, but just know that you're close to God. And there's, there's this deep awareness in all of us that when we connect with the environment, when we connect with nature, when we connect with the world beneath our feet, we're connecting with something powerful of God. And we have this awareness, but then we go into Christian spaces and we kind of ignore it. We lock ourselves in these rooms, whether it's dark or whether it's surrounded by concrete and white and stained glass, but we lock ourselves in these rooms and we, we sing these songs and we think that's how we connect with them. And this is an aspect of it, but he's available everywhere and in nature. And actually, as we read the Bible, we see that there's this deep, 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 deep connection to God through nature and through our stewardship of it. And in Genesis 1, we're not going to go there now, but in Genesis 1, which is, by the way, those of you that are newish, I love to quote Genesis. Now, I'm not quoting it as a literal, as a literal person. I'm quoting it as somebody who believes that Genesis is a poem, that it is filled with rich metaphor, that the entire gospel can be found in it. And there's this beauty within Genesis where you find that God's hovered over the waters and, you know, it says in Genesis 1, you know, um, God created the heavens and the earth and then it said the spirit of God or the feminine of God or the breath of God hovered over the deep and the dark, the broken and the disordered, the uncreated and the unformed. And we see it talking about creation and nature and the environment, but we understand because it's metaphor that it's also reflecting our lives. And whenever we see this in scripture where it's talking about nature or a storm or a rock or a mountain, that yes, it's talking about this, but it's also talking about us. That the, and I'm telling you this so you don't get confused because I'm gonna skip today between talking about nature and talking about you. I might talk about something that happens in the physical with nature and then skip the next sentence into talking about your trauma, crisis and pain because these things mirror each other. There's a symmetry between what God does in the created world and what he does in our lives and our hearts and our souls and our minds and our spirits, our fully integrated embodied us. And so we see this story as he you know, lays out and creates everything. And then in Genesis 2, we pick the story up that he's created humanity. And there's two words, Adam and Eve. These words mean humanity and life. And so humanity and life were together in perfect creation with God. And if we pick up the scripture in two, God looks down and he says, you know, it's good, not good for man to be alone. And so can we just grab the scripture? There it is. Oh, good, it's not on that screen. I was getting nervous. If we go back to, I think it's 18. Okay, Paolo, could you go and help out the back, please? Um, yeah, sorry, so we're on Genesis 2, verse 18, thanks. 
It might be 19. There we go. Now it says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals and all of the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man and see what he would name them. And whatever the man named each living creature, that was its name. Now the interesting thing here is that a name is quite an important and deep thing. That what a name does is it takes our observations and it turns them into our lived experience. You know, when you've got a baby, it's just a baby, and then suddenly that baby gets imbued with your hope for their future, memorials of who they are, whether you're taking variants of grandparents' names, and, you know, there's something about it. There's something about when we take an experience that we've observed and we name it. When I think about those sunrises I saw growing up in Nelson and that moment on the Great Wall, or the, I'm, I'm not the person that gets to name the Great Wall of China and name Nelson, but I can name that experience for myself, that there's an importance and there's a strength embedded in it that, that changes that thing that I saw into an experience that then is a monument of my life. And the Bible's littered with these experiences all of the way through that you see, and we're going to skip really quickly through a bunch of scriptures, that all the place names, the names people give to God, the names people give to each other are observations of something of the nature of God that's been transformed into an experience that then moves them forward. We have in, later in Genesis, actually let's just skip to the next scripture because I don't want to miss any out. We have, uh, yes, in 16. So we have this woman, we talked about it the other week, um, Haggai, and, uh, sorry, Hagar, and terrible experience. This is a woman who was a slave to Abraham and Sarah, who was raped, who was forced to be impregnated, and was then abused. And we can read it here. And sometimes the people we lift up as heroes in the Bible are not heroes in the way they lived. And as much as it's a painful thing to say, God uses the broken things of the world and even broken stories to bring beauty eventually. But it doesn't in any way um, promote or, or condone the brokenness that happened. Sari said to Abram, you're responsible for the wrong I am suffering. These are the abusers. I put my slave in your arms, and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me, rightly so. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do to her with whatever you think is best. And Sari mistreated Hagar, and she fled from her. If we go to the next scripture, verse 7. Um, might be a little bit on. No, okay, I'm going to have to ad-lib that one. Sorry, I'm just going to get my Bible. Sorry, guys, a couple technical difficulties this morning. It wouldn't be technology if it worked. Okay. And, okay. So, okay, great. Now, we actually, I may not have embedded this one in. So as Hagar fled into the wilderness, it says she encountered God and she named him the one that sees me. That in the midst of all of this pain, in the midst of all of this difficulty, in the midst of all of the turmoil and crisis and trauma, she's able to name God the one who sees her. Then if we go on to the next scripture, which I believe was in Exodus, Okay, we might just stop with the scriptures today and I'm just going to go through them off my phone. Um, if we can just put up the sky is red title card. Thanks, guys. And can I please have my glasses? <laughs> Again, if you're new, hey, we're family. <laughs> yeah. If we can just go with the title card. Thanks, Paola. Okay, so we've got in Genesis 32.30... Jacob's in a place, and he calls it Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been saved. We then go on, there's another scripture in Genesis 35, 15, where it says, Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken to him, Bethel. So there are all of these different places where they encounter God, and they name 
the place based on what they're seeing of the character of God, that he preserves, that he protects, that he speaks to them. We go, I'm not used to using notes. This is new for me. <laughs> then we, um, if we skip to Judges 6.24, it talks about a guy called Gideon. He built an altar there and called it the Lord is Peace. In Samuel, we have a story of, oh, I've skipped one, that's all right, uh, of him taking a stone and setting it up between Mizpah and Shen and calling the name Ebenezer. And he said, till, the, till now the Lord has helped us. And so there's all of these moments in scripture, literally all of the way through, where God reveals himself to people and they take the observation of what they've seen of him and they transform it into an experience. They name it so that it's something that sticks with them. And we have named experiences of God in our lives. And most of you, if I was to really quiz you, the moments where you've encountered God the most probably weren't in church buildings. For many people, I know that these experiences are when you're you know, sitting in the sun, when you're sitting in the breeze or on top of a mountain or in the middle of nature. And there's this, this beauty to it. And there are also moments where we encounter God, of course, in the relationships we have. So with all of that, I want to return to the scripture that we discussed in Matthew because there's something really special going on here. And so if we go to Matthew 16 again, I want to give you a bit more history. So they're in the place. So if you can find it, guys, it's the first scripture we started with in Matthew 16. And it says that Jesus took them to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, before we carry on, this is the Roman place name for this place. Now, it's a city. It was rich with sh shrines and political and religious importance, okay? It was uh, like a political hub. Before it was Roman-occupied, it was Greek-occupied, and it was known as a city called Panaeus because in the middle of the city, and it's still there today, was a massive cave and springs. It's at the base of Mount Hermon, and it was this beautiful place where people would go and bathe, and it was originally called Benias, which interestingly means build. But in the place of Benias were these beautiful sh uh, springs and caves, and it was a place of natural beauty. When the Greeks occupied the area, they turned it into a shrine for pan worship. And so it was a place of animal sacrifice, it was a place of parties and different rituals and things. And the whole area got known for its religious significance in worshiping the Greek god Pan. Okay, are you with me so far? Then it becomes Caesarea Philippi. So knowing this background, oh, and one more important thing. Pan was also known as the gate gatekeeper of Hades. And so Hades, not hell, okay, not, you know, place people go when they die. Hades is part of Greek mythology. And so this shrine, it's historical fact. You can look it up in multiple, multiple sources. This shrine in Caesarea Philippi was known as the Gates of Hades or the Gates of Hell. And it had a very large rock around it. This cave is at the foot of this big rock. Again, you can still visit it today. So, picking up the story, we'll start again in verse 13, so we get a nice flow going. Is it behind me? No. <laughs> okay. When, G when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So he's having an experience with, God, with Jesus. He's observing something of Jesus that brings life. That brings life and freedom and beauty that connects people back to the essence of who they were created to be. That connects people free from religious rule, free from their brokenness, walking through their trauma. He frees, he heals, he restores. And so seeing everything that Peter's seeing, or Simon Peter at the stage, he says, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus replies, 
And I want you to listen to, these, to the words because there's a lot that's about to happen. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh or blood, this, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. We're just going to stay there in verse 18. So he's standing in a place that was originally called build in Hebrew, Benias. He's standing in a place that was of natural beauty, that was rocks and springs and caves and places where people would go and connect with God. Then when other religions came in, they named it after other gods, they named it the gates of hell, they built on it with political stuff and religious stuff. Jesus is standing there. And I imagine when he says this, he's like, I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock, on this physical ground, this ground that has been named other things and has been claimed and built on and scarred and had trauma of, of war and occupation and cities and temples and things built on it, but under it all, it is a place where we will build. It's original name. He reaches through the name that was political, Caesar Philippi. He reaches beyond the name Panius, which was religious. He reaches into the name Build, and he said, this is where my church belongs. And I just picture him having his hands on Peter's shoulders, saying, what is reflected in this ground is reflected in your life. What is reflected in what I am doing in the earth is reflected in your heart. And names that we put on things, the gates of hell, is named this place, but before that it was a place where we build. And so in your life, whatever has been named, whatever scar, whatever trauma, whatever labels have been put on you, I will build my community here. I will build my church. I'll build the intersection between heaven and earth. I'll build the intersection where my presence dwells. And no name, no label, no scar, no trauma can define or break that. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now remember, this is not talking about where you go when you die. The keys to the kingdom of heaven is the authority to know that you represent God. That in the same way he reached into Peter's soul, connecting him to what he's doing physically in the earth, and saying, I call you back to who you were created to be and the beauty and the, the strength and the confidence of who you were made. You've got that authority to do that in other people's lives. Whatever you bind on earth, you know, whatever ways you restrict people, that's how they're going to see God restricting them. And on the ways you release them and free them, the things you give them permission to do in the way you live, that's how they perceive that God gives them permission, that we represent him, that God frees us to free others. He loves us to love others. He helps us transcend the names and the labels and the brokenness so that we can help others to transcend. It's pretty cool. And so the moments that I need to encourage you, because what we miss when we read this quickly is we miss the connection to, to the earth. We miss this connection to nature that we think, oh, you know, how many times have you said to somebody else, oh, I'm really struggling to hear God at the moment? I'm really struggling to connect with God. And yet it says in Colossians that he is in and through all things. He's the first and last of all creation. He's the beginning and the end. He, he is in and through everything. And in everything we have our breath. That we, we, we come to a church and say, oh, you know, I sung four songs. It was a fast one and there were three slow ones. And I listened to a guy speak and he was quite good looking and he had nice words to say and um, and you know um, and the people were really friendly but I'm still struggling to hear God then have a moment from this and your next sentence is going to be well it's really hot in Singapore like you're telling me to go and connect with God in nature but if I go to McRitchie I'm going to pass out after 15 minutes and it's like the most built up place and it's what the second most densely populated city in the world it's right something like that right don't quote me, but apparently it is. Um, 
you know, how can I connect with God and nature? I tried during worship. I went out the door and I thought, I need to see some nature. The only nature I could find was a tree growing on a roof of a shop house next door. And I thought, that's really cool. This poor little twig had seed, had found root in something and had put its roots down and was, was thriving the best that it could. But in the same way, he stands in Caesarea Philippi, a, na- a city named by Herod, after Philip, another, like they're just politicians, and it's about occupation and it's about their version of colonialism and control. And in the midst of that political turmoil, in the midst of a place that had been named after other gods that had been turned into the gates of hell, Jesus reaches through, and I imagine kind of scraping off whatever's there and stands on the rock that was under it. That in under this city, under your experience, you can still find God. You just have to... Oh, I've been practicing a thing this week as part of my Masters of an oil walk. It sounds weird. But literally when I'm walking my silly little dog, we love him, but he's still, I still struggle with the fact that we own this dog after a year and a half. And I'm following him around waiting for him to poop. And I have to... And this, this oil walk, it's a pug for those that don't know. So you agree it is a silly little dog. Okay, ugly and smelly and loud and kind of cute. He's got really bad breath. But I'm following this dog around and I'm trying to just connect with and have a sense of awe with the things that I see. And it's about slowing down your breath and noticing things you haven't seen before. And it's amazing. In the midst of this built-up city, it is beautiful. And it is phenomenal. And yes, you can get into the whole thing of architecture and the beauty of what people create inspired by God. But seeing the, the way that nature still finds space, that, that the beauty of the environment and what God's created finds and creates space and room for itself everywhere. Take those moments and allow God to speak to you there as well. Take this moment and create space for yourself to connect with God, absolutely. But take each breath and each moment to let him rename and bring you back to the core of who you're created to be. Beyond the trauma, beyond and through the pain and the loss and the other labels you've been given. And take moments to breathe. So it's incredible. Um, can we get someone from Creative Um? We'll finish, we'll pray. It's nice when we finish before quarter to 12. Then we can take additional time just to, to connect with people. Don't, when we leave today, please don't leave straight, straight away. Connect with people, meet them, spend time. Yeah, let's stand. Whatever position is comfortable for you, I just want you to... I, I've noticed I say put your hands in front of you a lot today. Whatever position is comfortable for you, I just want you to breathe. curtains. Can we get some natural light? Sorry it's not rolling mountains and sunrises. But there is a tree poking out at the top of that top of that shop house. Yeah. Moss is counted.
In fact, if you haven't heard it, we have this amazing translation of what is called the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come. It's from these guys in it. If you break it down to the Greek with the Hebrew interpretation, Laid off. <laughs> Have a great Sunday.